Reimagining India. Uh, uh, we have with us a power packed panel, but before we go into the panel discussion, uh, I would uh, want uh, uh, Palka Sani, who represents the uh, Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion, the department in India which actually is leading uh, the Make in India campaign to make a short presentation, followed by Mr. Dushan Thakur, uh, who is the Vice president, president of Invest India. This is a very interesting company. It's a it's a collaboration between the government uh, and uh, corporate India and Invest India handholds uh, any company that wants to come and invest in India. So once uh, the session is over, I guess uh, any of you who has any plans of coming to India, go and meet uh, uh, Dushant. Uh, Palka, if I just start uh, with your presentation on Make in India. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would first like to welcome all of you here as we celebrate India at 70 and India Sweden at 70. Uh, as uh, the moderator just mentioned, I represent the Ministry of Commerce and Industry here. Uh, we do run the Make in India campaign as they say, but it is the entire Indian government and the whole gamut of policy which represents Make in India. Make in India is not just a single program of any ministry. Make in India represents the new India. It rests itself on four major pillars, new processes, new sectors, new infrastructure, and new mindset. So what are we trying to do here? We're trying to reimagine India as a place which is easy to do business. We're trying to make new processes now. It's a business process reengineering done by government of India for the first time on such a big scale. We've done 7,124 ease of doing business reforms across the country. What are we trying to do? We're trying to make India an easier place to do business. I think we all know we did the landmark GST, the goods and services tax, which is, represents one nation, one tax recently. So what are we trying to do through new processes? Any company which is willing to come into India and faces the typical red tape, as we call it, of the Indian government is now eased out and it is being converted into a red carpet. What are we trying to do? We're bringing all states together. 29 states and seven union territories of government of India are coming together to make India an easier place to do business. Through what? India is now one of the most open economies in the world. You name a sector and it is open for investments from defense to railways to infrastructure to food processing to civil aviation, it's all up there. And the audience I'm talking to, Sweden has been our, one of our biggest partners in making India. Indo-Sweden business relations represent how Indian uh, potential when coupled with Sweden technology has helped India make a better place to do business. Uh, my esteemed panelists, co-panelists here, represent the brand ambassadors of Make in India. Each company represented here has a story to tell. How across the cities of India, we are gearing up to new investments. Invest India, as we just mentioned, is the next red carpet. It's a revamped company waiting for all of you. Each query being handheld by expert domain uh, people sitting there with you throughout the life cycle of investments, waiting to take you to the new India. So what has Make in India done? Ladies and gentlemen, we've seen a 62% increase in FDI equity inflows. At a time when global investments are going down, India has seen the highest ever FDI inflow in the last three years after the launch of Make in India. We received 160.7 billion US dollars. I know it's a small number, but we are waiting for more. We are opening up the economy. We're making businesses easier. And we've seen this as 32% of the cumulative FDI we've received since 2000. So Make in India brings together Skill India, Digital India, the Aadhaar numbers, the technology enabled India, the young India, all are coming together to call the world to make in India. Collaborate in India, make for India, sell in India, and sell to the world from India. As the earlier panel mentioned, we, we are an interesting nation. From culture to heuristics, we know it all. What are we waiting for? We're waiting for a partnership. 
partnership where Sweden has got its strengths in terms of technology, the deep dive. When these two come together, we can make the difference. And we've seen it. I will come back to my Make in India week and my Make in India event after this, where India, Sweden, and the new India, Sweden story is up for the world to see. Thank you. I'll hold it out to Dushan for the next slides. Thank you, Kalpa. Uh, thank you, Kalpa. Uh, hello. Uh, yeah. Thank you, uh, Dushan. As I said, uh, represents uh, Invest India, and uh, you know from uh, what I have seen from this uh, about uh, whatever I have seen of this company, they take uh, uh, they take good care of anyone who wants to go and invest in India and handholds them in every step. Uh, Dushan will share his experience uh, uh, in the next uh, five minutes on how they do it and what kind of uh, handholding his company has to offer. Thank you. Uh, I'll very briefly talk about you know some of the sectors you know where India and Sweden are already working together, and some of the sectors where we feel that you know the collaboration between the two countries can be much more deeper. Uh, automotive, uh, India is now the world's fifth largest market for passenger vehicles. However, our market penetrations are still very very low, 32 vehicles per thousand, making it very attractive you know for companies. Post GST, the car manufacturers have shown very strong growth, and uh, also, you know, our auto component, uh, you know, industry. Uh, in terms of the, you know, we have the largest number of Deming Award-winning automotive companies outside of Japan. Uh, there's a very, very clear focus on electric vehicles. You know, we've uh, also looked at, you know, getting an all-electric car fleet in the country by 2030. And it was actually earlier this week that the state-owned uh, Energy Efficiency Services Limited has invited global bids for 10,000 electric sedans to be used by government departments, as well as 4,000 charging points. It's just to, you know, give you an idea that this is some serious stuff which is happening as far as e-vehicles in India is concerned. We did hear about both uh, Volvo and Scania today, but just reflecting a little bit on, uh, you know, Scania's plans in India, when we look at the content, uh, you know, buses, 90% local content is there, but in trucks, it's only 12 to 15% content which is local, and that's what they're trying to scale on. And uh, number two, they're also, you know, looking at making India a global path sourcing hub. And in the next five years, there's also a plan to, you know, have uh, exports taking place to Asia, Middle East, and Africa from India. Uh, reflecting on to ICT and electronics, uh, but we just look at a couple of these numbers, 150 internet users and 100 mobile users added every minute. ICT is actually the game changer for India. Uh, Digital India, as you know, has been launched and, you know, where there's a focus on, you know, connectivity in rural areas, in electronics manufacturing, transforming. And this is a very big opportunity for Swedish companies. Uh, we have Mats here from Ericsson and, you know, he's, he's uh, done a huge, huge thing. We're talking about uh, Ericsson having something like 20,000 employees in India. Uh, also, in a similar way, uh, Sweden has the digital first strategy, which Indian IT companies are looking at in a big way. Uh, um, HCL Technologies acquired Volvo IT, and we also heard about LTI, you know, in the last session. Uh, moving on to industrial goods, now these are where we have, uh, you know, historical linkages. Atlas Comco came to India in 1960, and with four manufacturing facilities and two engineering competency centers. Atlas Comco products have been used in some of the most iconic projects in India, uh, be it, you know, you know, putting tunnels through Himalayan mountains to the real, you know, to the road which takes us from Delhi to Agra in record time. Atlas Comco products have been used all of these places. ABB is actually the partner of choice for the to transform the intercity metro transportation in the country. So they're working with various cities which are there. And they've also participated in the world's largest HVDC project, you know, which connects hydropower from Northeast India to Agra. Uh, so the specific areas, you know, for Swedish companies, heavy electrical equipment, uh, machine tools, earth moving, mining, manufacturing, these are the some of the areas which are there. Moving on to, you know, certain areas of collaboration, we did have this session on smart cities. We already had a MOU in the field of sustainable urban development, which is there. Uh, the Swedish side has launched the Sweden India Smart Cities platform, which, you know, works on various focus sub areas within smart city areas. And, you know, uh, companies like Sky which are running ethanol and biogas buses in Nagpur. Volvo has delivered its hybrid buses to Navi Mumbai. 
there's Swedish uh, intelligent video surveillance solutions being used, power and electrical solutions, intelligent lighting solutions at DT3 airport in Delhi. So, uh, you know, Swedish companies are already doing a lot of work in India, but now, you know, this opportunity gets bigger and bigger as we roll out, you know, the 100 smart cities. Startups, uh, another area, Stockholm, as we all know, is the world's second most successful producer of unicorns. We had, you know, True Collar here in the morning with us. And very interestingly, the sort of exits, the billion dollar exits which Stockholm has had. India's startup movement actually started after the year 2000. And we have currently 20,000 startups, 120 VC firms, and 1,300 new startups getting added each year. There's been a 40% year-on-year rise in terms of the incubators and accelerators. Now, how can Swedish startups access the Indian market? As well as, how can Indian startups learn from Swedish startup ecosystem? We'll talk a you know, little bit more about this Make in India event in Sweden in October. And uh, again, you know, startups is going to be a focused, uh, you know, roundtable there. Healthcare, again, you know, Sweden, we understand, has long tradition of delivering high quality economic viable healthcare. And this is a model which, you know, a number of countries are looking at emulating. Uh, we do have a MOU between the health ministries of the two countries, uh, which for, work on specific, you know, 12 identified areas. Government of India is also now, uh, you know, increasing its spend in healthcare, taking it to something like 2.5% of the GDP. Uh, looking at the business potential, you know, talking about an uh, area like med medical devices itself, India currently imports 70% of its medical devices needs. And uh, some of the Swedish companies like Getting and Sandvik MedTech have already invested in India. Uh, I believe the Indian cabinet yesterday also approved the MOU between India and Sweden on the IPR areas. Uh, retail and food processing are some of the other areas where there's already you know, a good amount of action which is taking place. Taking on to you know, Invest India, that's the agency which I represent, which is going to be your facilitating partner, the facilitation partner. It's very interestingly structured where we have the central government, the state governments, as well as the chambers of commerce which have come together to create it. So we will provide you end-to-end -end facilitation support. We are a comparatively new entity, but we've been awarded amongst the best IPAs in the world in the last two years. So with these few words, I'll just turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dushyant. Uh, as the title of uh, this session uh, is uh, about uh, technology, reimagining India, make in India. So let's take forward what we heard in the past 10 minutes. Uh, as, you, as you saw, uh, the government has taken uh, more than 7,000 uh, reforms in the past three years. The idea is to ensure that uh, the government doesn't come in the way of you going and investing in a country like India. But let's see what has Make in India meant uh, for the country as a whole. It's uh, perhaps one of the most high profile campaigns uh, that was launched in the recent times. Uh, and it has shown uh, you know, tangible results. Uh, for example, within one year of launching of uh, uh, the campaign, we saw uh, a 27% uh, increase in uh, FDI. In the second year of uh, the Make in India campaign, again, uh, uh, FDI levels were at a record, 29% uh, growth. Uh, the momentum continued, continued in the second year, and, and, uh, and uh, the foreign in direct investment inflows uh, stood at $40 billion. In the third year, we saw, again, record FDI inflows of uh, over $44 billion. Uh, uh, but uh, the pace has come down. Of course, so one reason is uh, the kind of high base that we have seen uh, in, in the past uh, two, two, three years regarding FDI inflows. And, and remember that these inflows have come, come even as uh, uh, you know, uh, capital is not available. Uh, foreign investment inflows are not happening in other parts of the world. So let's try and discuss, uh, can we reimagine or rejig or change tracks or have uh, a more focused make in India. Then the reason I'm telling you this is because if you look at the FDI figures and desegregate it, while there are record FDI inflows into India, um, most of them has come to services sectors, sectors like telecom, sectors like uh, 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 computer, sectors like construction. It's not that it has not come into manufacturing sector, but uh, the quantum is low. 
Um, the panel here uh, is 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 uh, is uh, represented by uh, some of the top voices uh, from uh, the Swedish companies. Uh, I have uh, on my right uh, uh, Mats uh, Agrevi, who is the CEO of uh, Combient, uh, and uh, he's no stranger to India. He was with Ericsson and IBM, and and has spent about eight years in India. Knows Indian business business environment uh, very thoroughly. We have uh, Hakam Bushke, who's a Who's a you know self-confessed uh, uh, in, 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 Indophile, I would say. Indian holic. Indian holic, he says, <laughs> and uh, he is pitching to sell uh, one of the most uh, advanced uh, fighters that exists uh, in the system, the the, the Gripen to both the, the Indian Air Force uh, and uh, the Indian Navy. We'll talk about that. Uh, we have with us uh, 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 Mr. Frederick Fexi, uh, who is the deputy CEO of Business Sweden. There are 170. Swedish companies in India, and as Palka said, uh, you know, Sweden is one of the most uh, important partners for make in India. Uh, these Swedish companies have created more than one and a half uh, thousand jobs uh, in, 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 in India, direct jobs, uh, indirect jo jobs, if you do the calculation, it will be more than 600,000. So we'll take some perspective from, uh, from them. We also have with us uh, a representative from Air India, which is our national carrier. It's a government-owned company, and yesterday, Air India started the first direct flight from Delhi to Stockholm. And I hope you guys take the flight back uh, to Delhi and go and see what India is all about and come and invest in India. What was more, in more interesting about this flight is that it was an all-woman crew and uh, we had uh, the Captain uh, uh, Nivedita Bhaseen, uh, you know, who led the flight uh, from Delhi to Stockholm. And, and what's, what's more interesting is she is uh, perhaps one of the first flight crew uh, uh, to have flown in an all-woman flight way back in 1985 in India. So a lot of exciting stuff happening in India, but I would uh, want uh, 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 Matt to start and give his perspective on the topic. Uh, Matt, you have uh, three minutes. Thank you. Um, we live in challenging times. I think we live in exciting times. I think we live in the times of opportunities and innovation. And we are right now at the tipping point for the digital revolution. If the industrial revolution lifted us humans above the limits, the physical limits of our muscle power, the digital revolution we lift us beyond the limits of the, our brain. And uh, we live now in the age of data and AI, artificial intelligence. And suddenly, we will reinvent, we will disrupt the way we live our life, how we run, and how we drive our business. My own personal twist on uh, a speech which was done on Independence Day of the Honorable Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, it's the time of the job creators, not of the job seekers. Because this is the time of innovation and entrepreneurs, and that creates so much job opportunities. So I think we will come back to that a little bit later. Convient are actually a collaboration platform for the industry, made by the industry, which was started 2015. And one of the key individuals behind this, and also one of the majority owners, is my colleague and friend here, Horkan, sitting next to me. Our purpose is actually to help the participating companies to become digital masters in their industry. Today, we have 21 companies who collaborate. It is a large enterprise from Finland and Sweden. There are a number of 21 companies today, uh, with a common uh, joint turnover of 1,200 billion sec, Swedish krona and more than half a million employees, which is now working together. Our collaboration in the beginning was mainly focused on actually exploring emerging technology and understand the digital concept as a whole. Today, our focus has moved on practical real implementation into the companies, but also to questions like business models, organization, talent, and culture. What I feel is unique with the collaboration model we have is the openness and the trust we have within the group. And that is something I feel has been created, of course, by the fact that no one of those companies compete. But also I think it is because of our long cultural tradition of cooperation and working together, which we have up here in the Nordics. 
If we look about where we are today, I think we have had very good tractions since the two and a half years when we started. Within the group, we have now several companies who I would claim has best practices, digital best practices, which is on par or even better than the ones you normally hear about in the world, and they normally come from US or Germany. We are not as good at marketing here in the Nordics like they are. But still, of course, there is a long way to go before those companies will be fully digitalized. I spent eight years in India, and of course, I love that country, as I love Sweden. And I see that India and Sweden has a perfect fit. And if you look to Sweden, we have a long history of industry research. We have domain knowledge in the industrial areas. We have very technical, advanced products, and we also have a very flourish startup sector. If you look into India, it's a very interesting market, one of the biggest economies in the world and the fastest growing one. A huge competence pool, and on top of that, deep IT knowledge. This is a rather good combination, and I'm convinced that we together can create and build the next generation of the digital industry. Tanavad, thank you. Thank you, Max. Uh, uh, Hakon, uh, as I said, uh, is uh, the CEO of uh, Saab and, uh, and uh, he knows India pretty well. Uh, Hakon, can we have your perspective on yes, the topic? Thank you, and it's, of course, a great honor for me to be here today and discuss the future of India, and at the same time, the celebration of the 70 years of independence and how Sweden and the Swedish company can contribute uh, to the growth of India going forward. Just to reflect on the growth of India, I, I took, uh, I like uh, figures and statistics, so just to address at least the, the Swedish uh, participant to this conference, maybe this is, of course, figures that is well known for, for the Indian participations here. But uh, it's a fantastic story to go back uh, just 10, 15 years. Uh, some examples, the number of poor people is down with more than 50% the last 13 years. There is, and it's under 20% today. At the same time, the last 13 years, the population in India grew with 30%. It's amazing. The gross national product have also increased with five times at the same period. Uh, 13 years ago, uh, India had the same gross national product as Sweden has today. So it's a prime time up since. And uh, India aims to be the third largest uh, uh, economy in 2025. I, I believe that is possible. Uh, but it also means that uh, the growth rate needs to be between 7 to 8% annually to exceed Japan. And what is really encouraging is to see Prime Minister Modi and his government uh, doing all those reforms that is necessary to understand the country, the tax reform, uh, other financial reforms to create a more open market. And I think that has been extremely important as we speak uh, right now for the growth uh, last years, but also for the growth the coming years. There are a lot of initiatives from, from the government as, as we speak, and uh, probably more will come and are needed. I think also uh, it's a great opportunity for, for India when it comes to industry of what we call 4.0. Uh, the digitalization of the industry from design, production, and aftermarket is a great possibility to create stronger companies in India, and I know already today many of those companies are taking that uh, route, and increase the competitiveness on the international market. Uh, of course, India is a huge market, but I think also India should take their share of the global market, and that will increase prosperity in the country. Uh, job creation in the industry due to that possibilities will be great, but not in the traditional way. But at the same time, you need to build up services and other things that I think is an 
an even a, a bigger possibilities when it comes to job creation. I represent a company called Saab. We have been around for 80 years, serving uh, the Swedish Kingdom and the international market for defense and security. We do everything from fighter aircraft to uh, submarines, but we also have a fairly big uh, civil uh, part. 50% of all the airports you land have a Saab air traffic management system. Uh, six of the 11 largest ports in the world have a management system from Saab. The coast is guarded by Saab technology in India, for example. Uh, we believe in R&D. We believe the possibility of failure as well. Because everything you put your money into will not be the right thing going forward. But if you are not as we do, we are spending 25% of our turnover into R&D. That's a world record. There are many good ideas coming out from that and creating an environment where people have the possibility to explore their own capability. And uh, for me, being the CEO of Saab, that's probably the most important thing to create that environment. Uh, we have been in India for 40 years with production. The last seven years we have a, had a tremendous growth, both when it comes to sell products, but also the number of employees is now between four to 500 employees, mainly doing export from India. We are the only foreign um, uh, defense and security company having uh, an R&D center in India. So we're already involved of, of developing uh, the, the next generation of grip and, and, and other um, uh, security products already. So we are fully committed to make and develop in India. And we see uh, Sweden and India, as Matt said, has a perfect match. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I forgot to tell our uh, uh, panelists that there is uh, a timekeeper sitting and she has been flashing the red card at us. Uh, so uh, uh, may I request uh, you to give your perspective and stick to the time limit of three minutes, please. Of course, of course. <clears throat> I'm very happy to be here today and to sit in this uh, panel. Uh, generally, I'm a very happy person. <laughs> and why I am so happy uh, is that I have one of the best jobs in Sweden. Uh, my job is to be Deputy CEO of Business Sweden. And what we do, we help Swedish companies to unleash their full potential internationally. That gives me the pleasure to work with gentlemen as these two. But it also gives me uh, the pleasure of working with gentlemen and a lovely lady as the, uh, the ones over there. Uh, and to work in countries that are really, really exciting. Uh, one of those countries, and perhaps the most exciting one, is of course India. Uh, now, I also lived uh, four years in India. Uh, when you left, I came, and then when I left, you came. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and India truly is incredible. Uh, I really miss India. I miss just having the opportunity to go for a Pani Puri between meetings. <laughs> it's not here in Stockholm. <laughs> there's not, there's some, some food trucks coming up, but they cannot really serve it properly and a Dalmakni every now and then. It's not really there here in Sweden. Uh, what I miss is the vibrant business life. I miss the, uh, the, f the food, of course, but I do miss the people. And, and people is the key here. Uh, it's really the key to what do we actually make out of Make in India and what do we make out of uh, Industry 4.0 and digitalization. I mean, the people in India, warm-hearted, always positive, always solution-driven but also very intelligent. And that's how we see things like Jugaad happening. Uh, traveling all over India, you see the most fabulous can innovations. Can you explain the concept of Jugaad to your... Uh, well, uh, the way I see it uh, uh, is it's practical innovations on, a, on an everyday basis using what you have. We have a concept in Sweden called uh, you take what you have, uh, Kaisa Vai, uh, and we, we use it in cooking. But in India, we, you use it in everything. <laughs> it's all over the place. <laughs> And it's kind of practical innovations. And it's not really what we are good at in Sweden. We're good at high-tech innovations uh, and, and uh, uh, things that will win the Nobel Prize, but perhaps not always the, the everyday innovations. So in combination with fast-growing industry, development of supporting regulations, which is a key here. Uh, we have to have l uh, no corruption and, and so forth, uh, less uh, red tape. And with the digitalization, uh, India will definitely be number three in the world and beyond that from my point of view, probably the largest economy in the world. Thank uh, you. And I'm not finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are, we are on time. Yeah, yeah. So, so I have three questions, or three things uh, uh, that, I, that I find interesting. One is that, I, I think that, that we need to address, one is 
how can India embrace Industry 4.0, really embrace it? Because when India does, it, it will be a catalyst. So be more digital. And I think there's, a, there's an issue here of will uh, automation and robotization take away jobs? Or will it add jobs? That's one thing that is really important. That's actually the first question that I was asked, going oh. to ask all of you. <laughs> Anyways, continue. Sorry. Uh -huh. uh, second one, S India is fantastic in the service sector. Uh, from my opinion, Industry 4.0 will open up a totally new world service sector. And India is already there. You're the leader in the service sector. So that's an opportunity to take. And the, the, the third one is the startup scene, uh, which was uh, excellently addressed by uh, Dushant. Uh, but you need to do it more. We need, we need to see more unicorns from India. And, and those are three topics that I find uh, very interesting. So it's not only make in India, I think it's, it's also innovate in India. Right. Uh, Pankaj, uh, your perspective on this entire topic. Uh, he represents uh, Air India and he's a commercial director for our national carrier. Well, it's a great honor to be. Uh, yeah, it's, it's on. Yes, it's, on. on. Yeah. it's a great honor to be here amongst you. And uh, let me first of all wish you a very good morning. Uh, the topic for today is uh, India 2047. Uh, so that's something which we need to go into the future. And future is fortune telling and which comes very naturally to Indians. Uh, <laughs> so the topic today is not so difficult for me. Well, uh, it's exciting to imagine uh, what our future has in store for us and uh, what it's going to be, because it helps us, it empowers us to uh, work towards uh, that, what you have wished today. So uh, I will start uh, uh, a bit on the background that what we were and what we are today, and what I see uh, uh, in 2047. So I won't exceed my time. Don't right, worry. Please, please carry on. <laughs> well, uh, uh, 2047, uh, hopefully, India would be one of the most thriving nations. Uh, we would definitely be the uh, top three economies of the world, and we would be uh, driving the 22nd century for sure. Uh, in terms of civil aviation, uh, Air India, uh, we became independent in 1947, but our first flight took off in 1932. So we are uh, 15 years uh, before the independence of India. And uh, in 2032, we would be celebrating the 100 years of Air India. Uh, we were the first airlines uh, who had uh, become a totally jet carrier in Asia. All our aircraft were jet aircraft. Uh, as the days progressed, we moved on from 707s to 767s, 747s, and now we have in our stable a fleet of almost 27 Dreamliners, which is state-of-art Boeing 787. Uh, with this background, we are poised to be uh, one of the leading um, civil aviation markets in India. Definitely the third spot would be there in the next three years. Uh, I just would like to give you the perspective that today, under 2% of Indian population actually flies. Under 2%. And in the year 2047, I estimate that this under 2% is going to become roughly about 10%. And if it is going to become 10%, then how many more aircraft we require? We probably be requiring uh, somewhere in the range of 3,000 aircraft. Uh, so we are sitting on a volcano of potential. And I expect that this is going to just be unleashed in the next five to seven years, and in 2047, it's going to be just among us. Uh, predictions? I would say artificial intelligence, as my friend just mentioned from uh, the panel, is going to determine the civil aviation as well, because it's a technological-driven industry. Uh, days are not far when we all would be flying with a pilotless aircraft. Now, how much it is accepted amongst all of us? So uh, that's to be seen, but I'm sure in 2047, we would have aircraft which would be flying on its own. 
And I also foresee that what you see today on the surface, what we see today happening on the roads, in 47, we would have a replica of this up in the air because the skies are going to become so crowded um, that we would have special corridors for flights that going transatlantic or going Pacific. Uh, not anyone anywhere can go, but it would be highly regulated because otherwise uh, the kind of explosion what we are going to have in the civil aviation worldwide it's going to create uh, a chaos. So I would see that what is happening on ground today would be up in the air in 2047. Uh, we have uh, in India uh, a domestic civil aviation growth of about 26% year on year. So for the last two years, we have grown uh, by 26%. It's the highest in the world? Uh, it is highest in the yeah. world. And uh, in the next three years, we are going to become the uh, top three civil aviation industry market in the world. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, so we'll take forward from whatever discussions that we had. And we had fantastic input from the entire panel. But let's, as I said, uh, start with your question. And before that, you know, by, you know, the, the, by, by doing the research, I found that uh, when we talk of 2047, uh, reports upon report, be it by uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers or Howard University or even OECD, pegs India as the second largest economy on, on, on purchasing power parity terms by 2047. Uh, anyways, um, let's talk about Industry 4.0 because uh, as of now, even as we speak, uh, in shop floors, machines are talking to each other in Europe, in Sweden, in US. Uh, now, under what is known as Industry 4.0 protocols. Uh, how does uh, or how should India adapt to this uh, new uh, paradigm? Uh, uh, because A, on one hand, there is a necessity to be competitive, otherwise you are totally out of uh, uh, business. But on the, on the other hand, you also need to take care of uh, uh, the, the, the job market, for example. We do not know how Industry 4.0 uh, will impact the job market in an in a emerging uh, market like India. Uh, so, according to uh, you, uh, uh, how does uh, a country like India, how does an emerging market like India balance the need between competition and the need uh, uh, to, to also ensure that labor markets are not disrupted? Well, uh, from my point of view, uh, there's only one way to do it, especially for a country as as India. And I, and I totally acknowledge that there's a lot of challenges. Uh, of course, the, the, the job market and also the, the uh, poverty and, uh, and uh, there's a lot of things happening. But if you if you... Uh, if you um, uh, lift your uh, mind a little bit, it's, it, you can only embrace it. Because you have smart people, uh, you have technology, and you have the market. The only way to do it is to embrace Industry 4.0 fully. And there's a few examples. I mean, will it create less jobs, or will it take away jobs, or will it create less jobs? Uh, from my point of view, it will create new jobs. We have a few things uh, in history that, is, uh, that I find interesting. Uh, when we saw spinning jenny coming in, to the industry, in the garment industry, textile production. Did it create less jobs or more jobs? It created loads of more of jobs. But when it came, it was, a, it was a kind of a hostile thing coming in because, of course, it took away a few jobs, but it also created a lot of new jobs. Uh, we have the assembly line in the beginning of the 1920 with the T-Ford, where standardization came into the picture. You didn't, didn't need to handcraft all the cars. Uh, now, did that uh, create more cars or less cars? Uh, more cars. And, and, and uh, today, when we all got our, our mail in the iPhones, uh, I, I did a, I worked actually at the Swedish Postal Office, the, the Royal Mail. It's not the name in Sweden, but the, the mail. Uh, and, and then email came, and now we have it in our cell phones. Do we send more mails or less mails? So, so what happens when we introduce new technology and new ways of working, uh, which might rightfully pointed out, it will create new jobs. And the only way to not be left behind is to embrace it. And, to, and, and in the long run, it's the only way to go. And then, of course, I do uh, understand that it could be difficult for certain job groups uh, in the short run, of course. But you need to take the medicine. I thought you said uh, Indian companies are already embracing uh, yes. uh, Industry 4.0. Yes. Can, you, can you give us uh, some No, but I, I mean, if you look inside. at the Tatas, uh, Mahindras, and a lot of others, they, of course, already adopting uh, this type of technology. And I, for me, it's more of a view uh, where, of course, you see India as the market, or if you see India 
uh, as an export of products around the world. And I, I think that the, the, um, the, the second thought is the right one. And also bear in mind that in India now, we are, we are building up capacity due to the big growth also of needs in India to then do the right investment from the very beginning will bypass um, uh, Indian companies on the world market due to the situation that many of uh, companies around the world have already invested in industry 3.0 mm -hmm. and will have a lot of difficulties to move to 4.0. I think it's a good example on that, even though a lot of things are happening. It's the, the uh, east part of China. They are through an uh, enormous uh, change, as we speak, where they can't really f uh, meet the, the um, uh, competitiveness. So uh, I think it's then, then you are coming into other things when we are talking about automation, digitalization, and that's more of a, of a tax issue. I know it's a debated thing, but this will create more wealth then how to spread the wealth is a different issue. And then you can put more uh, efforts into services to, to um, well, the social sector will, will increase. Schools is a huge need for that. So, um, but if you have the engine, the industry, creating more jobs, I, I mean, there will be a lot of jobs needed still doing by, by uh, men and women. But uh, if you create an, an efficient uh, companies, that could be on the world market, creating uh, good economy growth for your nation. It will also create jobs in other areas. That's my belief. At match, uh, you were in India for eight years, right? Uh, and you have worked with uh, Ericsson and IBM there. Uh, going by your experience in that country, uh, how capable are Indians uh, in terms of uh, adopting or leading uh, the technological innovations when it comes to uh, Industry 4.0? Is it, does the capability exist in terms of institutional capability in India? I think for sure it does. Uh, and also now when we talk about the Industry 4.0, I think you have to look at it from two perspectives. One is the one who is the user of it. The other one is the one who is the producer of it. And there is two different opportunities. And I mean, if we start with a user perspective of Industry 4.0, first of all, we don't drive digitalization of the industry only from a cost and labor perspective. It is also because it makes it possible to launch products much faster than every time we have done before because you get a much better efficiency and secondly you get a much better quality as well and you can do jobs in a better way than you could do with humans so thereby digitalization in itself is a foundation for the new industry we have but at the same time I feel also that a lot of people believe that it will be factories without people mm -hmm. and I guess some of you probably have, like me have been and looked at the most automated car manufacturing plant which is which I think is BMW in Germany and there is certain processes which is using industry robots but still you get amazed about how much work is done by people to put together a car so, so I think from a usage perspective I think it is a must in India to drive industry 4.0 because it builds the competitiveness of your product and your industry but at the same time as you do you will create a lot of new jobs which is coming on top. Which also means reskilling of people? Sometimes but at the same time I think Friedrich you talked about spinning Jenny and I think if you look into the textile industry that's an industry which is very hard to optimize. And that's a big opportunity still because it's a labor type of job. Mm -hmm. so, so I think it is about if you look into the skill, if we talk about the usage point of view, I think you have three roles which is happening. I mean, one is more simple, if we can call a work simple, but more simple type of works, which assembly or you're working or you're putting things together, which our robots today can't do, right? And that's a big opportunity, and that will be growing. The more industry you get to India, the more of that kind of jobs you will get. The other part of that is the technical experts. And they need to be the super gurus, right? They need to be the best. And that is a, maybe a little bit a challenge, but it's not good enough to have an average technical person today. You need to have the best ones, right? But that group will be very important. And there, I think India has a big opportunity with its background with so many IT companies. But the third one is a growing group, which is the business translators. And there, if you only look at the US now, I read a report about that they need about two and a half million business translators in the coming decade. What are business translators? A business translator is a person who understands the business but can turn it into digitalization. So you live in two worlds, right? Mm -hmm. And that will be an extremely important group into the future because they are the one who will drive innovation. 
So coming back to where I started, I think for India, you have a huge opportunity to be a user of Industry 4.0, and that will attract companies to come to you because it is not only about robots, it is about labor still. So the combination of those two things makes India very competitive. The second opportunity for India is to be a producer of Industry 4.0. Mm. And with the industry and the knowledge you have in India, if you could work with countries like us in Sweden and understand more of maybe the industry domain expertise, you can also become a big producer of Industry 4.0. Right. So, uh, so from my perspective, it's a big opportunity for India. Palka, uh, would you want to come in on this? Because they made some very interesting points regarding how, uh, how we, we could uh, go forward regarding Industry 4.0. Yes, so just, just taking an example of, let's say, the power sector, like just we mentioned about uh, how India has to make a transition. But India also has an opportunity because India is an unexplored market. Like coming to the power sector, I've worked in the power sector myself in the country, and I can see we, let's come to metering. Like if uh, we, people move from manual meters to digital to smart, but there are unexplored areas in the country where you do not have a meter. So you start with a smart meter, and when it comes to jobs, you create newer jobs by people who are trying to analyze the data out of the smart meter. He doesn't need to move physically, but then because if there's a smart meter there, not only it creates energy efficiency, as a user, a consumer is benefited, as well as as a producer, the, uh, the, uh, the government company is also benefited. So India, seeing India in, uh, in the perspective of uh, Industry 4.0, we also uh, are an adv advantage because of this unexplored potential in terms of automation. So we will make this jump, and when we make this jump, this huge repository of uh, the human resources we have, not just reskilling, I think the first time skilling also can be to a higher level skill. And let's not look at our country as a country of manual labor only. So our young population is educated, IT enabled, so they can pick up fast and become a part of this job market, which is not just uh, an assembly line production. Right, Pankaj, uh, I, I wanted to uh, discuss one very interesting point that you made. You predict that India will require 3,000 aircrafts in the next 30 years? Yeah. Right? Uh, why not make those aircrafts in India? Well, that's a very, very brilliant idea, but... Uh, um, Today, we have uh, very few aircraft manufacturers who are uh, making commercial aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, but, but what will it take for Boeing and Airbus to come Very and soon, the facility from uh, the Boeing company and the Airbus company, I would expect that with the kind of orders mm -hmm. uh, which are going to be placed on them, it would not be far when the uh, manufacturing would come to India. Mm -hmm. uh, Boeing have started doing something in China Mm -hmm. And uh, Airbus Industry and Boeing both, they have components coming in from various parts of the world. Mm -hmm. But uh, in times to come, definitely there's a huge opportunity for all these aircraft manufacturers to come to India and uh, set up the shops there. Right. Akon, uh, 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 I'll come to you in, in just one minute. You know, you are a company, uh, you belong to a company which is offering uh, its technology to manufacture the Gripen in India. So why should a company offer its technology uh, and investments and money to have facilities in India. What does it take uh, for a company to do or make such a, have a, such a decision? It's a simple fact for us. 99.9% uh, .9 of the world population doesn't live in Sweden. 16% mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> live in India. And uh, we are much taller uh, than, uh, than Sweden. Uh, we are not a superpower, uh, but we have the finest technology. And to find partners, with equal values and share common use. Uh, to share something is also extremely good because that will create also greater opportunities for us to do more investments in, in India, to develop even further. But it will also have a good effect on the Swedish defense capability due to have a partnership, exactly the same way we have done it in, in, uh, in uh, Brazil. So for us, we need partnerships. Uh, we we um, are a small country and uh, need to partner and share technology. You can't have anything if you don't are willing to share or give something. It's, it's a wrong thought. On the end of the day, you find models, and we have shown that in other countries, where we can, 
can uh, uh, also share the, the outcome of that type of, of uh, technology transfer. Right. Frederick, you wanted to make a point? Yeah, I, I think we're on to something really important here because, because the, what I find really uh, interesting is that India has such much potential, uh, but it's about unleashing it. And, and what I think sometimes we talk about the smile curve, you, you probably know it. Uh, where do we bring the most value into products? Uh, and, and it's definitely a higher value when you invent something than pr to produce it. So uh, what, what I think uh, could be very beneficial for India is to basically look into how, when will we see great innovations coming from India? And, and we have some of the smartest people I know are definitely from India. Uh, and, and why don't we get a lot of innovations? And just using, if you see, look at Sweden, we're like 9 million people. But when we had our greatest uh, inventions, we were only 3 or 4 million people. It's like one small area of South Delhi. Uh, and <laughs> and we have huge, we have fantastic companies like Com uh, Combiant and Saab, Ericsson and so forth. It's basically about what are you fo so focusing on and do what game are we playing. So there's a difference between me and Tendulkar uh, being a cricket player. Uh, is that perhaps I'm a better cricket player than Tendulkar. Perhaps I'm the world's best uh, cricket player. But we don't play cricket in Sweden. <laughs> We don't know the rules, we don't, there's no, I couldn't even gather a team. There's some teams coming up now, actually, but, but we don't have it. So basically, it's about what game do you play? Do you should, India should play the game of innovation. Uh, Saab is the only one uh, building a new fighter today, a uh, new submarine, at least in, the, the, uh, in our part of the world. But what I think is a huge opportunity for India, and I, I believe if you should develop these type of... Uh, high uh, profile and uh, high technology products is to have the whole process together. Uh, you can't just have people doing design and engineering and then you ask someone, can you please produce it for me? Mm -hmm. It has to be combined. And I think that is the, the most important uh, lesson learned. I think most of my colleagues, CEOs around the world, if you can't talk to each other, the guy doing the design... Can't be in design, silos. Uh, yes. And I think that's a huge opportunity for, uh, for uh, India to do that. You have skilled engineers, you have skilled designers, skilled workforce, and you can, due to the density of population, you can put people together. Don't, don't just think that you should do only design and engineering or something like that. It's the combination and bringing people together and create that type of environment that will, will uh, create competitiveness for, for India. Right. I think we have less than five minutes, right? Uh, uh, let's let's uh, end our discussion on the point regarding innovation. DIPP, again, is uh, taking the lead in what is known as Startup India. Um, uh, if you can just tell us about what the, has it meant uh, in terms of thinking about such a program of, of, of for encouraging innovation, and, and what do we uh, see in the recent future as far as startup is concerned? Either you or Dushan, if you can just give a yeah. quick perspective. So maybe just a couple of points. I think I'll just uh, go back to that starting line that, you know, we are talking about here more about job creators than job seekers. Mm -hmm. And India's, dem we are talking about, you know, 10 million jobs a year. Where do they come from? Right. You, you know, so that's what is being instilled in our systems. We are trying to see that, you know, uh, so, so from, from the perspective of startups, uh, that's what we've seen, that uh, there's a huge amount of interest which is there amongst uh, you know, Indian people which are there. Uh, they, they're all very well educated. And uh, that's where you know, Government of India has launched Startup India. Uh, very clearly, you know, there's a facilitation aspect which we are handling there. And uh, just to share some numbers, we've had something like 60,000 you know, queries which we have you know, responded to in less than a year and a half. So that just shows you know, what sort of interest is there. And uh, I did share you know, a couple of numbers in the presentation of how it's sort of going up. But uh, it's, it's again something which is not happening only at a national level. Startups is something which is happening at a state level. So in, uh, I would say since January 2016, 11 states in India have actually come out with startup policies. And it is a very critical aspect of you know, uh, the overall uh, industrial policy of the state. And you know, all of them are sort of moving into that. And uh, so, Palka, you know, you, you talked about how states are competing with either, each other when it comes to innovation and also, you know, attracting investments. This this spirit of competitive federalism. Yes, uh, 
India was seen as one big nation of like now 29 states and seven UTs that we have with each state doing its own thing and some states not going aggressively after investment but after the launch of Make in India and the rankings that states now are competing for on ease of doing business, I see state after state trying to open up, trying to go down to the level of the district and ensure that no investor now goes back from a state. And there's huge competition and the reforms that I talked about, each state is undertaking these reforms and investment is no longer a word which was seen as you know a counter to social development in the state so now we all understand that it is these investments which are bringing in the jobs and which are also bringing in the infrastructure so each state is now competing okay so the red card is up uh, uh, but uh, you know i would want uh, uh, yeah sure sure Just comment uh, one thing that we see now, we see it globally, but we see it in Sweden, is the combination of startups and, and, uh, and global leaders. So the combination of companies like Saab and Comias and startup uh, open up the labs, uh, opening up the labs like ABB is doing and so forth. A lot of companies are doing that. That's something that is also worth looking into. Right. Uh, so, uh, uh, Hakon, uh, Matt, and uh, Sir, uh, I would want you three guys to uh, uh, do the concluding remarks on a topic which is related to innovation, and that is accepting failure. Because you know, it seems that you know Indian companies need to be uh, while they some of them are engaged in R and D. Most of them are R and D averse. Uh, they would not want to put in you know capital when it comes to R and D. Uh, how uh, is it okay to fail when it comes to innovation and R and D? And if so, uh, uh, you know, uh, how do you how do you take that failure and and then turn it into your success? Uh, story well if, if i start i think mm. if you look at the swedish uh, gross national product today take ericsson for example it's just the beginning of a well it, it, it the product that they deliver today is skunk work the whole cell phone was an innovation coming from the development of the griffin uh, radar or the da data link and the management tried to avoid putting money into it mm. and that's their whole existence today and I, being the leader, and also I have three engineers um, examine myself, probably a very poor engineer ending up the, as the CEO. But if I, I uh, looking into uh, all the smart people we have at, at Saab, if you create an environment, if you put uh, and also listen to the people, what they have possibility to do, then you will foster an environment where you can develop things also according to schedules that you have, but at the same time solving these type of difficult problems, people need free time to do a little bit things of their own. So there we uh, also giving uh, money or shares in the company for the best skunk work of the year. And some of the schedule things is not going in the right direction, uh, so we have lost some money on that. On the other side, uh, the skunk work uh, gives us a tremendous lot of possibility. What I mean is that uh, when you're dealing with things uh, very much on the R things, uh, research, and especially when it comes to things that you can't Google, you need to accept failures and learn from the failures and not punish people uh, and, and bringing people together and learn from the failures because then you can take next step and create an, an, an um, positive uh, momentum for, for next technology move. Right. Matt and uh, Pankaj, you have just yeah. one minute each, right? right. Uh, yeah, if, yeah, if you can just uh, conclude. Uh, if, if I listen to CEOs today, I think this is a fair statement for most of them. They have never been stronger than they are today, but they have never been more uncertain about the future than they are today as well. Regardless if you are building a truck or a car or an aircraft, I think most people are pretty uncertain about how will it be five years from now, ten years from now, with all the new technology. So when you look into the future, would you put your bet only on your R&D internally and believe that they know what's going on? I don't think it would be a good bet. So the only way to survive today is to open up, work with others, learn from others, be open and follow what's happening. And one way of doing it is like we do together, to talk with other industries, create networks where you can discuss and learn from each other, the other part is to open up against the startup world because failure is a natural part of learning something new. And we need to embrace that. 
And the cheap way to fail is to do it together because you share the risk. And that one is, of course, to work with startup companies because they are much faster, more efficient, and you can fail to go with them. So, so I think if we talk about the future, we want to embrace failure because we're all learning, but we have to learn together. That's my point. Right. Pankaj, the Maharaja has the last word. Air India has the last word. Well, uh, <laughs> the charm of enjoying the success is only when you have faced failures. If you don't face failures, then uh, you, everything what you do has to succeed and there's no charm left then. Uh, well, in the aviation industry, uh, failures are definitely uh, not what we are looking for at all. <laughs> uh, we invest a lot in uh, R&D. We invest a lot in learning from each other, as Mike has just mentioned. Because uh, the, the, the chances, I mean, the failures are not accepted in this industry at all. Right. But yes, uh, in terms of planning, in terms of expansion of our root network, uh, we do a very clear uh, evaluation of the markets, we study the potential, and uh, there are times when we have made mistakes and we start operating to a territory where uh, our predictions went absolutely haywire and we had to pull out after a few months. But I'm sure with the kind of uh, audience we have, uh, my last endeavor, which was to connect Sweden with India, and we brought in the non-stop service yesterday, I have no doubt in my mind that it has to be a success and not a failure. Right. Thank, thank you. you. So that's the last word. Thank you for joining us. We are completely out of time, and thank you for joining this session. But don't leave yet. Uh, Palka has one more uh, quick slide to show. She shows yeah. me the red flag. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what we discussed today, we're going to take this forward. And uh, uh, I, this was the Make in India Week, the celebration of Make in India in Mumbai. And the Honorable Prime Minister of Sweden was there with the entire industry delegation. And what's coming up next is the Make in India Sweden. So, 12th and 13th of October is when Make in India comes back to Sweden. It's a two-day event where we will discuss the synergies between India and Sweden, and uh, we will showcase the achievements and potential, and all the Swedish companies will be here as brand ambassadors. Uh, just a quick outline of the session, so we will have the Swedish uh, India Business Roundtable, followed by the CEO session, the Honorable Commerce and Industry Minister from Government of India is traveling. We will have a session on Make in India, and we'll have an innovation session, as well as a startup session, and we will have focus sector roundtables on auto, engineering, healthcare, smart cities, and a number of B2B and G, uh, B2G opportunities. So I look forward to seeing all of you there. We have a Make in India website, and the registration page is up on the website. So I invite all of you to please come and register, and let's take India and Sweden's energy forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.